Ladies and gentlemen, am I on? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilmer's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. The more state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain is conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Ah, oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they've parted, and the professor moves around one side, studying the object while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait a minute. Something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. The Lord, they're turning into flames. Now the whole field's caught up by the woods of the The, the gas tank, tanks of the automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Indelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We continue now with our piano interlude. Good evening, everyone. I'm Professor Andres Velendovsky uh, from the School of Mathematics and Physics of the University of Lincoln, which organizes uh, those uh, AstroChats. Uh, this is our second AstroChat with our distinguished guest, the Professor Don Kurtz. Uh, before we start, I'll just tell that there will be a short presentation uh, by Don, followed by a Q&A session and uh, you can put uh, questions uh, uh, in the live chat of YouTube uh, um, uh, channel. Uh, as I said, this is our second Astro chat. So those who uh, didn't come to number one, I'll just say a few words. Uh, Don uh, has a, a, a long and distinguished career in astrophysics uh, spanning almost a quarter century in uh, South Africa, followed almost 20 years here in United Kingdom. And at this uh, moment, uh, Dawn is a, a visiting professor in the University of Lincoln, uh, but also um, a distinguished uh, professor in uh, uh, South Africa in Northwest University, where he is now joining us using this uh, video link. Uh, Don has uh, uh, over half thousand of research publications, author of textbook, uh, uh, prolific public speaker. On uh, his career, he served as vice president of Royal Astronomical Society. And of course, uh, he's probably the best person who knows everything about aliens. Uh, I'm very happy, uh, Don, you're with us uh, tonight. And I'll give a uh, floor uh, to you. Welcome. Thank you, Andre. Uh, that's very interesting for me to hear that I know everything about aliens. <laughs> that's a very interesting introduction. Good evening, everyone, or good evening to those of you who are uh, joining us from Lincoln and from the UK. Good some other time of day for those of you who are joining from other parts of the world. Let me now shift to the presentation. So just a moment while we get a screen share going here. Ah, this doesn't always work as I want it to. Okay, once more, I'm still working on it. We are now going to a screen share. And Andre, could you tell me if we are all seeing the first slide? UFOs? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. So 
fine. There you'll see in this first slide a picture in the upper corner. Just a moment, let me get a cursor that you can see. This always takes a little bit of maneuvering when we first start off. Up here, we can see a crashed flying saucer. And so the question for us is, are aliens visiting the Earth? Now, before we started this talk, you listened to about two minutes from a very famous radio broadcast by Orson Welles, October the 30th, 1938. It was a dramatization of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And some tuners came in late. They didn't hear that it was just a dramatization. And as you heard, it was done in the style of a live radio broadcast, a news broadcast. And many, many people took it to be real. They packed up the kids, the dogs, got in their cars and took off from New Jersey where it was supposed to be happening, even New York City, and headed for the hills in fear that the aliens were actually invading. This particular picture you're looking at now is a picture of Orson Welles talking to the news people the next day, October the 31st, 1938, saying he had no idea that people were going to take it seriously and be so frightened. If I can take you back to the late 1800s, an Italian astronomer named Schiaparelli had thought through a small telescope that he could see what he called canali on Mars, and canali in Italian meant channels. But an American philanthropist who built an observatory in Arizona, Percival Lowell, took canali to mean channels and thought that these were actually channels built by intelligent aliens on Mars to channel water from the polar caps of Mars down to their dry equatorial regions where he thought the weather was changing, conditions on Mars were getting worse, and hence it was possible that aliens might come from Mars to Earth to look for a better place to live. And that's what H.G. Wells' story was about from the early parts of the 1900s. Following that, this was just before World War II, people were in a state of uncertainty. The war was coming, there was a lot of fear, the skies were not full of planes as they are now, and flying things in the sky, perhaps from other planets, seemed like a very real possibility. Following World War II, that really took off. And let's talk about some of those incidents. The birth of flying saucers. I think most of you, probably all of you, have heard of flying saucers. But why flying saucers? Who invented that? And there is an answer to that. His name's Kenneth Arnold. And here is the first report of flying saucers. Supersonic flying saucers sighted by an Idaho pilot. And there you can see, this is in a big Chicago newspaper, 26th of June, 1947. Kenneth Arnold was flying a rather high performance single engine plane near Mount Rainier in Washington state. When he saw some objects, he said, out of his window flying at incredibly high speed, supersonically he judged it. He wrote a report that was classified originally, but then unclassified. Here's from his typed report. And here's a kind of sketch that he did of perhaps what the object looked like from the top or from the side. But he had a newspaper artist do a sketch for him, and he described the objects as being rather boomerang shaped. And this is a picture of Kenneth Arnold pointing to one of these flying boomerangs he thought that he saw outside of his window of his private plane in June 1947. The news media interviewed him, and he said that these objects were flying erratically through the air. He said that they flew erratically like a saucer would bounce across the water if you skimmed a saucer across a pool of water. And the next day, the newspapers reported flying saucers, not flying boomerangs, and it's been flying saucers ever since. So there's the source of the term flying saucer. Then came an event a couple weeks later at a little town in Roswell, New Mexico. Some of you will have heard of this, perhaps not everybody, but the Roswell event is very famous amongst those who believe aliens are actually visiting the Earth. So what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico? Did a UFO crash near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947? Yes. Did the US military collect the remains of that UFO? Yes. Did they lie about it? Yes, it was a cover up. Following that, surveys indicate 4 million Americans now claim to have been abducted by aliens and flying saucers. Could 4 million Americans be wrong? 
Yes. So what really happened in Roswell, New Mexico? Here's the newspaper report, July the 6th, 1947. The Roswell Air Force, Army Air Force, this is not Royal Air Force here, folks, this is Roswell Army Air Force. Uh, the U.S. Air Force didn't exist at that time, it was still Army Air Force. Captures a flying saucer on a ranch in the Roswell region. No details of the flying disc are revealed. Well, you can't read that newspaper because it's blurry, but here's what that opening paragraph says. The intelligence office at the 509th Bombardment Group at Roswell Army Airfield announced at noon today that the fields come into a possession of a flying saucer. According to information released by the department, over the authority of Major Jesse Marcel, intelligence officer. Some people think that the term intelligence officer for the Army is an oxymoron. I'll let you judge that for yourself. The disc was recovered on a ranch in the Roswell vicinity after an unidentified rancher, I can tell you now his name was Mac Brazell, had notified Sheriff George Wilcox here that he had found the instrument on his premises. Major Marcel, in a detail from his department, went to the ranch and recovered the disc, it was stated. After the intelligence officer here had inspected the instrument, it was flown to higher headquarters. The intelligence office stated that no details of the saucer's construction or its appearance had been revealed. The higher headquarters was Carswell Air Force Base in the state of Texas, and there it went to one General Roger Ramey. And so the next day, the newspaper reported, General Ramey empties Roswell saucer, says the excitement's not justified. He says the disc is just a weather balloon. And Roger Ramey was lying through his teeth. He knew that it wasn't a weather balloon, but he was lying because he didn't want the public to know the truth. What really happened? Out of the Roswell Army Airfield, the US Army Air Corps was flying high altitude spy balloons, which would be launched from New Mexico, a very remote place where few people would see this happening, especially back then. And they would then lift to very high altitude where the winds would take them around the world over Russia, where cameras would then be spying on the Russian nuclear program. Now, some of you who are old enough may remember only a few decades later, a few years later, in the mid-1950s, the U.S. was fly flying spy planes over Russia, spying on the Russian nuclear program. And Francis Gary Powers, flying a U-2 aircraft, was shot down in Russia. He was put in prison in a little town called Vladimir. I've been there quite a few times myself. It's a very beautiful town with beautiful cathedrals with a famous prison. Francis Gary Powers was in prison there. The Russians crowed about his capture, and the U.S. denied all knowledge of him until many years later when Francis Gary Powers was admitted to have been flying a spy plane and he was exchanged for some Russian spies that the U.S. had in captivity. So Roger Ramey was lying because this program of spying on Russia was absolutely top secret. And of course, if you ask the military about any top secret project, they will lie to you. They can't keep it secret if they tell you the truth. Why was the material so mysterious? Why was Jesse Marcel even confused by it in any way. I've seen some pictures of Jesse Marcel with the material, and most of it looks like aluminum foil, obviously part of the balloon. There's some wooden pieces, and then there's some very mysterious writing on what turns out to be tape. And the linguist at the time could not identify what language this writing belonged to. So it was deduced that it belonged to an alien civilization. Well, what really happened is that physicists and engineers built this balloon, and when we're building equipment, this isn't a factory. It's often one-off, and they needed a roll of tape to hold something together, and nobody had any, so one of the people went down to a local toy store where he found some tape in a toy shop, and some artist had put squiggles on the tape because they thought that might look entertaining for children. It wasn't an alien language. It was just artistic squiggles on some tape that was needed to hold the instrument together. So the Roswell incident, incident was not a flying saucer that was captured. It was a super secret uh, spy balloon that was spying on Russia. Now, following that, there was a lot of fear of aliens flying in the Earth's atmosphere, of visiting the Earth. Mysterious things were being seen in the sky. Some of them were actually military planes that were being tested. They're being tested at very high speed. And when people occasionally saw them and called up 
the Royal Air Force Base off Scotland, where tests like this happened, said, are you flying weird-shaped planes flying at high speed? And, of course, the Air Force lies about it. Nope, we're not doing that, because they're secret test flights. And then aliens began visiting. Here's an alien timeline of various aliens, mostly Americans, have been abducted by. They're the little green men from 1947 when all this starts. And then all the various supposed aliens that people have had artists draw for them, having claimed to have been abducted by spaceships. There is really no evidence that spaceships are here. If any of you happen to have uh, tuned into this from South Africa, where I am right now, some of you may be surprised to see that one of the aliens here looks suspiciously by the famous previous South African president of more than 100 years ago, Paul Kruger. Aliens are not visiting. So who makes up these stories? Where do they come from? Well, here's some newspaper articles along these lines. And here's a picture of an astronaut having a pee on the moon. And the article says, water found on the moon is astronaut pee. Well, of course, this astronaut can't be doing that if he could unzip his spaceship, his spacesuit. There's a vacuum out there and he's going to be dead very quickly. Up here, a crop duster plane in Argentina is being attacked by a giant sparrow. And the article actually says the crop duster is busy dusting. The pilot had fought in the Malvinas War, the Falklands War, and he was more terrified of this sparrow than he was of the RAF pilots he had to flight, fight in the Falklands War. Um, that may not say great things about what he thought of the RAF, but he was supposedly flying crop dusting, and it said when he saw the bird, he dived to a lower altitude. And I have to tell you that the people writing the story blew that because crop dusters fly right off the ground. And if he flew to a lower altitude, he flew right into the ground. And of course, down here, five U.S. senators are space aliens. Given the activities in the U.S. in the early part of this year, you might believe that. But there's a picture of the first George Bush and Bill Clinton walking with a space alien. The answer is there's a lot of money. There's fame and fortune in getting attention from people by making these stories up. Some people really believe them. They think they've been abducted by aliens. I would say that they're deluded. Lots of people just make it up because they get attention. And TV programs, of course, thrive on this sort of thing. If they can get big audiences, they can sell their advertisements at very high prices. I see no evidence that aliens are here visiting the Earth. Now, you think I'm closed-minded. You astronomers, you're really closed-minded. You just won't consider the possibilities. So let me tell you that of all the people you've ever met or listened to, I as an astronomer, my colleagues, we're the people who most want it to be true that there are really aliens out there, and we want to be the person who makes the discovery and tells the world about it. That is one of the most important discoveries in the entire history of humanity, to prove that there's life on another planet. There's fame and fortune in that, and none of us would resist making that claim if there was any evidence that was even of slight interest to us. Now, what about other things associated with UFOs and aliens? What about crop circles? These things started in the UK. I'll show you where in just a moment. And they've now become incredibly elaborate. In fact, they're called crop art, and they can be very beautiful. Here's a nice picture of some crop art where the circles have been put into beautiful patterns. Could these be landing sites for alien spaceships? Well, the story started with Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley in Wiltshire in England in 1976. They had been listening to stories about aliens and flying saucers while drinking at their local pub, and they decided to go out one night and make a circle in, as you can see here, some already harvested crop. And they did that by one of them standing in the middle of the circle, holding a rope, and the other one going out to the edge with a plank of wood with the rope tied around his waist, and then just walking in a circle and flattening the crops. And this was taken seriously. You go back to old New Scientist magazines and, and various other publications in the UK, and you can find discussions, maybe the whirlwinds, vortexes that are coming down and making these. No scientist was taking seriously the idea this might be a landing spot for a flying saucer, but they were looking for natural explanations. And Bauer and Shirley carried this on for quite a long time without getting caught. The reason they eventually did get caught is that one of them's wife began to become suspicious he might have a girlfriend because he was staying out late at night mysteriously and wouldn't tell her what he was up to. And he finally admitted it wasn't a girlfriend. 
um, the two of them were out making crop circles. So there are no aliens necessary for the crop circles. There's still people who would like to believe that and admit that some crop circles are made by people, but oh, the others, now nah, my those things might be real. Well, you can you can go to the crop circle websites, and in particular, if you'd like to read about this, there's a great article on it in Smithsonian Magazine. It's called Crop Circles, the Art of the Hoax. And if you just put Smithsonian Magazine and put crop circles in, you'll very quickly find this article with a very detailed discussion. But then what about the Bermuda Triangle? Planes and ships disappearing mysteriously in the Bermuda Triangle without a trace. Nobody knows what happened to them. They're just gone. Those stories come from one Charles Berlitz. Charles's grandfather was the Berlitz who founded the Berlitz language schools. Charles was born in New York City. His family were European immigrants, and his father, who was a rather rigid man, decided that when Charles was born, every member of the family would speak a different language to the baby. Charles's father spoke German to him. His mother spoke French. His grandfather, who was in the home, spoke Russian. They had a maid who spoke in Spanish to him, and by age of four, he was completely fluent in all four of those languages. By the time he was eight, he was fluent in another four languages, and by the time he was an adult, he reputedly spoke fluently or close to fluently 32 languages. His daughter once said that he never met a person that he couldn't speak to in their own first language. So he was a brilliant linguist, but he was credulous. And he heard these stories of the Bermuda Triangle of Atlantis. He wrote books on it, became even more famous for the books that he wrote. But he either didn't tell the truth or he was told stories that he didn't check out. So he describes in his book on the Bermuda Triangle, a U.S. Air Force jet disappearing without a trace, no call in by the pilot, he's got a problem. He's flying in to land in the Bahamas Islands and he just disappears no trace whatsoever. Others going back to check it out find that the pilot did radio in. He had engine trouble and he ejected from the plane. The plane crashed in the sea. The pilot came down possibly with his parachute, but his life support equipment, it appears, didn't work and he disappeared in the sea too. Things can disappear in the sea. It's big and it's deep. Off the south coast of South Africa, where I'm talking to you now, when I first came here in the late 1970s, a ship disappeared off the city of Port Elizabeth. Uh, it now has a new name. It's called Cabeja. Um, Port Elizabeth, off that coast, a ship disappeared without a trace completely. Did aliens get it? And the answer is no. We get big seas coming down off the Indian Ocean here, coming up out of the Antarctic, coming out of the Atlantic, and occasionally... Waves coming from different directions will meet in the same place at the same time. They're called freak waves, and they may stand up 60 meters. And a 60-meter wave is big enough to swallow a small ship. And occasionally ships disappear at sea for that reason. We don't need aliens coming to kidnap our planes and our ships. We understand that they can sink in the sea. Now, if it should happen, most of you are probably listening in on this from Lincoln, if it should happen that a train pulling out of Lincoln Station disappears without a trace with everybody on board, that would be a much more interesting event and would catch our attention much more than ships and planes disappearing at the sea. No aliens needed there. So this accusation that we astronomers are closed-minded, we don't have an open mind, I don't agree with that. And the person I know who put it best, he's not the first to say it, but he put it in his famous book, The Demon Haunted World, Carl Sagan said, keeping an open mind's a virtue, but not so open that all your brains fall out. I can recommend this book to you highly. Those of you who don't know Carl Sagan, perhaps you're young enough you don't remember, he originally did a TV series called Cosmos that's recently been re redone by Neil deGrasse Tyson in the US. And Carl Sagan wrote many, many interesting books on rational science, scientific topics. And so with that, let us go to our question time. Thanks for your attention for the talk. Am Thank I back, Andre? This on very fascinating inter there introduction. We go. And now we are open for questions. Uh, 
uh, let, let me um, uh, uh, ask <laughs> first question myself, because you mentioned Carl Sagan, and it's almost a quarter of a century ago, was fantastic uh, movie uh, Contact with Judy Forster, uh, mm -hmm. a kind of listening signal from the space. And uh, <clears throat> if the program of kind of listening to the signal still on, or can you just say a few words? Oh, the answer to that is yes. Um, there are projects to listen for signals from alien civilizations that is still on. And in fact, it's been expanded. It's recently been funded at $100 million by Yuri Milner in California for more radio telescopes to do that. And so the SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, there's an entire institute for it, and it still continues. Do you know, if we were out on a planet, now Sirius is about 10 light years away. It's the brightest star in the sky. It's up in the evening sky tonight. When you go out, well, it's raining where you are, it's cloudy, but next clear night, you can see Sirius nice low in the west now after dark. But Sirius is not a good place to find a planet with habitation because it's too hot, its life will be too short. But leaving that alone, if we were on a planet out at the star Sirius, orbiting Sirius, looking back at the Earth with our radio telescopes, we could pick up television programs that left planet Earth 10 years ago. I leave it to you to decide whether we would conclude there's intelligent life here or not, if we watched earthly television. But we could do that, and we could pick up such signals from alien planets out to a distance considerably beyond 10 light years, and we've not picked those up. That effort is still ongoing, Andre. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Don. Uh, it's uh, yeah, very nice. There are lots and lots of questions that come in, and I will try to to read uh, uh, um, uh, as many as I as I can in our time. There is a question here: Has anyone reported aliens in countries other than United States and United Kingdom? It always uh, uh, seemed funny to me that the alleged. Uh, uh, flying sources uh, were predominantly seen in United States? Um, that's a very good question from the person who asked it. The answer is yes, they are seen in some other countries. Um, Belgium seems to be very attractive to aliens for some reason. But what I find interesting is when I go to, I had a visiting professorship in India for many years too. And when I go to India and I talk to my colleagues there, they never discuss this question. Apparently, UFOs and flying saucers don't visit India. Now, why should that be? Well, I would suggest that Indians being predominantly Hindu and having hundreds of millions of gods, whatever it is in people that they're satisfied with aliens visiting, I think that the Hindus are satisfied with their very rich religion. That's my speculation. But you are right. They predominantly go to the U.S. And the U.S. Air Force is about to release another UFO report in a week or two about mysterious objects, primar primarily visiting around San Diego in California, where I come from. And I have to admit, I'm very suspicious that aliens would fly across the galaxy and come to planet Earth and only be interested in the United States. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Uh, um, I s see the question uh, from Anthony uh, from Thinking Ahead, who asks, uh, what is the minimum intelligence to qualify for intelligent life? Oh, Anthony, I don't think that that question can be answered in a definitive way, but let's think about the way we astronomers think about it. Um, we are searching for intelligent life that would have technology like we've got so that we can detect them. Now, you and I probably would both agree that there's a significant intelligence in elephants, in dolphins and other cetaceans in the sea. These animals have got significant intelligence and it appears some self-awareness, but they're not in a position to detect technology, so we can't detect them. And so when we talk about detecting intelligent life somewhere else in the galaxy, we're looking for something that's broadcasting radio signals that we can pick up. Now, here on the Earth, we've been broadcasting radio signals now for over a century. They've been escaping the Earth, and so we should be visible to radio telescopes out to over 100 light years. But, you know, we're not going to do that for very much longer. You yourself logged in tonight or probably logged in on fiber optics. You're not using microwaves passing through the air that are escaping from the Earth. And eventually, we will wire the entire Earth with fiber optics, and we're not going to waste energy 
producing radio waves that escape the planet. And it's maybe that intelligent technological civilizations only do this for a couple centuries. And then even if they're out there, they're going to be very hard for us to detect. Thank you. Uh, and it's a kind of a, a related question uh, here. I see what kind of evidence would be required to persuade scientists that uh, uh, flying saucers and aliens are visiting? Um, a flying saucer and an alien in public possession that we can look at? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there is one more question here. It's kind of uh, related. It says, and given that uh, uh, many believe in phenomena that cannot be directly observed, but rather inferred from other phenomena, like uh, black holes. So it's probably related, you know, uh, an observation of aliens. Well, you're, you're certainly correct that we do believe in things. Believe, we need to watch this word believe. We as scientists um, use the word to believe for a, a good working theory, but we always hold in our minds that that might be disproved later and we'll stop believing in that thing. And so it's not a belief in the sense that it's an absolute truth, but it's certainly the case that we think it highly likely that our theories of black holes are correct. Black holes exist. The circumstantial evidence for them is very strong. And so you're asking, could there be circumstantial evidence that aliens were visiting here without having the direct evidence of a flying saucer or an alien spaceship or aliens themselves? And I would say, yes, that's possible, but I've certainly not seen any circumstantial evidence that attracts my attention. Thank you. Uh, now a question from Fernando. Uh, uh, what do you think about uh, Stephen Hawking's repeatedly warning about the dangers of humankind meeting alien civilizations? That's an interesting statement. And let me actually, before I answer that, throw in, there's also something called the Fermi paradox, where the great Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi back in the 1950s said there can't be any aliens out there because the galaxy's old. And if there's a lot of alien life out there, then some alien life would have developed for billions of years beyond us and would have explored the galaxy and they would be here. And since they're not here, they're not out there. And so there's exactly the other point of view from another scientist. Um, I don't go with, I, I don't think it's conclusive what Fermi said. And for Stephen Hawking, I'm not the least bit worried about it because the stars are a long, long, long way away, and it takes a long time to travel between them. I suspect that if we are to explore the stars, or if other alien civilizations do, if they're biological creatures like us, they don't go. They send machines. Why send, why send humans or aliens across the galaxy? I would expect you to send machines. Now, Stephen Hawking might say, sure, but those machines could be warlike or dangerous. But it's still a long, long way between the stars. Think that it takes light four years to get from here to the nearest star. And to accelerate a spaceship up to near the speed of light, you would need the energy in more than the mass of the spaceship itself if you convert it at 100% to energy by E equals mc squared. This is a very, very hard problem. And I don't claim to be in the same league as Stephen Hawking as Enrico Fermi, but I would say, I think it's possible nobody does it. It's just too hard and too expensive and nobody bothers to travel the stars. Let's find each other and talk to each other. Why go there? <laughs> yes. It's what we're doing right now with this talk. Yes, exactly. Uh, th there is actually uh, here just question. Um, uh, if uh, we would find life on Mars, do you think the government would tell us until it was obvious? Until it was what, Andre, last obvious. word? Obvious. Until it was obvious. Oh, no. I, the government isn't control over finding life on Mars. The finding life on Mars is in the control of the scientists who are running the experiments. And let me tell you about keeping secrets. Uh, Andre, you're Ukrainian, Russian. I grew up in America. In our youth, there was still a Cold War going on. And yet the nuclear secrets that both countries were trying to keep secret from the other with top secret programs, uh, generally the military figured they could keep things secret for about two years. People talk. In the case of nuclear secrets, they talk for money, usually. But fame, but people will do anything for fame. 
And the scientists who find bacterial life on Mars, if they find it, that is a career-making, life-defining moment. And you might threaten some of them and get them to keep quiet, but you can't get them all to keep quiet. They, they will risk everything for the fame. You just can't keep secrets. It's too hard. It's not in control of the government. And if bacteria are found on Mars, it's going to be in the news the next day. As soon as they're sure, they're going to announce it. I'm completely confident of that. And I hope it turns out to be true, and we're going to hear that soon. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, uh, here, we uh, kind of uh, note about Mars, moving a little bit closer. Uh, good evening, Professor Kurtz. Academics who have studied the pyramids in Egypt say there is evidence contained within hieroglyphs uh, that uh, flying saucers and aliens uh, have been seen there uh, in these writings. What are your thoughts on this? Thanks. I don't. I don't believe that claim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to me, that's hearsay. But let's go back to the pyramids. The pyramids are very precisely aligned with respect to the stars. Very, very high precision, extremely um, precise engineering. And some of the claims that have come along have said, these Egyptians 5,000 years ago, this is 5,000 years ago, I'm a modern person and I couldn't do that. How could they do that back then? Aliens must have come to help them. And the fallacy in that argument is that 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians were very, very smart people. And we do know how they built the pyramids. They were extremely good surveyors and they were able to, humans built the pyramids. Uh, I don't know of anything in the Egyptology literature that actually claims the hieroglyphs suggest there were flying saucers coming. And since flying saucers were only invented in 1947, that's a bit 5,000 years too earlier. Maybe they should say that they're claiming that Aliens were visiting the Earth. Um, I don't believe that that claim is actually present in the hieroglyphics. Thank you, thank you, Don. Uh, here there is a, a question from Haley. Uh, uh, do uh, flying saucers and aliens uh, uh, um, sightings violate our understanding of physics? It's a very good question, Haley. You know, I know of only one astronomer in the whole world who's actually seen a UFO. And since that was me, I can tell you the story. I used to work at the University of Texas at McDonald Observatory in West Texas. A McDonald Observatory is on a mountain called Mount Locke. It's over 2,000 meters above sea level. Uh, it's in a remote part of West Texas, and no commercial flights fly over it. There are no planes in the sky normally. And out of the biggest telescope there, a laser for when I was working there, a one billion watt laser was fired out of the telescope several times per night to bounce off of mirrors that were left on the moon. And that could measure the distance from the telescope to the mirrors on the moon to a precision of just a couple of centimeters, which is how we measure the moon drifting away from the earth in continental drift. But the US Federal Aviation Administration had a rule that planes were not allowed to fly over the observatory because they thought if a pilot looked down the barrel of a billion watt laser and was blinded, that was a bad idea. The Federal Aviation Administration thinks blind pilots are not a good idea. And so the pilots, the planes didn't fly over the telescopes. Now, I was walking out to work one night. I go to work at nighttime, just as it's getting dark. And the mountain drops off 500 meters to the valley below. And they're coming at my face faster than I've ever seen anything move. In total silence were two lights coming up out of the valley below. That was a UFO, unidentified flying object. That's not the same as a flying saucer. So we have to ask the question, could an unidentified flying object be something we know about, just don't recognize? Something new and some new physics that we don't know about yet? Or perhaps even aliens flying around, coming from other planets around other stars. That last explanation is the most difficult explanation. And we've learned in science long ago, start with the simple. And only when the simple explanations won't work do you begin to think, oh, there might be something in the more complex ones. Yes, it's possible that some sightings in the sky of unusual things that are seen might be some physical manifestation we don't understand yet. I certainly wouldn't rule that out. We don't understand everything that's happening. We're only just beginning to understand, for example, red sprites, which are kind of upside down lightning, high 100,000 feet, 30,000 meters in the atmosphere. Things happen up there and lights happen. And so, yes, some of the explanations for unidentified flying objects might be physics that we don't know. 
often it's physics that we do know. I got a call in the middle of the night when I was living in Cape Town from, from a friend who lived not too far away saying, go look out my window. There was a flying saucer outside the window. Go look. Uh, and I didn't even get out of bed because I knew what time of night it was. And I knew where his bedroom window was because I knew the couple. And I just said, you've got up in the middle of the night, Chris, and you're looking at the planet Jupiter. So sometimes it's easily recognizable things. Now you're wondering what was my UFO coming up out of the valley? It was a U.S. Air Force fighter jet with terrain following radar, which can lock the plane to only a few tens of meters off the ground, flying at nearly the speed of sound. He was completely illegal. He should not have been there against the law. And he almost flew between the two telescope domes. He gave me a big fright. I didn't bother to follow up because I knew that if I called the local U.S. Air Force base and chastised them for their planes flying over the observatory, they would claim they weren't there and they knew nothing about it. Now, pilots, especially a fighter pilot, is not a cautious person. You don't put a cautious person behind in the cockpit of a fighter plane. It's not the kind of person you want there. And for career advancement, these people have to do what they call pushing the envelope. They need to break the rules, both physically with the plane and in terms of their ability with it. But they mustn't break them so badly they get busted for, for disobeying orders. So they're constantly pushing the limits. Now, there are rumors that the U.S. has got a, a plane that can fly at something like Mach 8. I think it's called the Aurora Project. What do you do if you've developed a plane that is faster than any plane that's ever been built and you want to keep it top secret, but you've got to test it, which means fly it in the sky? Well, the answer is you paint it black. You give it stealth development so that it's got angular wings so the radar doesn't bounce off it very much. You have no lights on it. You fly it at night, and you fly it in a part of the planet where there aren't too many people. Now, there's nowhere where there's nobody. There are 8 billion of us. And a good place like that's the North Atlantic, off the north coast of Scotland. And occasionally you get reports from that area. Somebody's seen something really weird moving at an incredible speed in the sky. And they'll call up the RAF, and the RAF says, well, we don't know anything about it. Of course they do. And so some of these reports are really, uh, sorry, probably, I don't know, it's, it's top secret. I'm not in on it. But they're probably top secret testing of military planes that nobody's letting on about. But the rumors get out. It's hard to keep the secrets. And so we do hear about it, that such things exist. Um, yes, uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, uh, um, answer on um just as you mentioned, all this uh, military technology. And there is a question uh, from Matthew Arnold. Could science entertain the idea that some of non-military technologies uh, sightings might be from parallel universe? Science, this was Matthew. Matthew, the science Matthew can, Arnold. yeah, Matthew, the science cannot entertain the idea of something coming from a parallel universe. It's not within our remit. Uh, we as astronomers, we as scientists study the universe. That's everything that's known. And we don't know anything about things that are outside of that. And so any speculation, and it is just speculation, about parallel universes um, simply doesn't come under the label of real science. Uh, and then I then see question from Jana uh, uh, Kolarova. Uh, did you experience anything in your professional life that made you think this might be aliens? Uh, presume it was as you would sure tell us what it was. <laughs> the answer to that, Jan, the only time that happened to me was the incident that I just described and the thinking, not knowing what it was and kind of having my heart in my throat, what, what's coming at me lasted for only a matter of seconds. And then the unidentified flying object was clearly identified when it went over my head at low altitude at nearly the speed of sound. The identification came quickly. Uh, you know, I gave this a talk like this once at the Edinburgh Science Festival. It was at something called the Café Scientifique in the hub. It's a deconsecrated church up on the Royal Mile. And at the end of my talk, which was short like this one, the first question came from a man sitting right in front of me. And... I would actually describe him as having rather wild eyes. I hope he's not actually tuned in tonight listening to this one again. And he looked at me and he said, do you know that there are aliens here on Earth masquerading as humans? 
And I looked back at him and I said, sir, I just spent 20 minutes telling you that I don't believe aliens have ever visited the earth. Do you think that I actually might be one of them and that this entire talk has been a cover up? And he took this question completely seriously. He slowly looked me up and down from head to toe. And then he said, no, no, you're much too humanoid. Now, I told my wife that, and she's delighted to be one of the few wives in the world who knows for sure her husband's not an alien masquerading as a human, as determined by an expert. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, I'd like actually to ask uh, one more question from myself. Uh, uh, apologies that there are many, many still questions, but I really um, kind of was waiting uh, for a moment. Uh, as we kind of have doubts that, you know, aliens visited us, uh, still uh, lots of, for instance, science fiction writers, uh, and uh, 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 my favorite is Stanislav Lem, uh, were spending a lot of time trying to think how we will meet those uh, different civilizations. Will be they different from us or will be they similar to us? And what is your view on that? If there is civilization somewhere else, are they in similar stage of development? Will be they humanoid or will be totally different like a, a Solaris uh, thinking ocean? What a wonderful question and what an exciting thing to work in. And in Edinburgh in the UK, there is an entire institute of astrobiology, which is looking at ways to try to detect life on other planets to start with non-intelligent life. But part of that project is to try to think of how we might communicate, not thinking we're meeting them face to face, but should communications come? Should we detect radio signals from another civilization? How do we begin to decipher what they're communicating? How do we communicate with them? And Carl Sagan himself put a lot of thought into that with the Voyager missions, and they put a plaque on one of the Voyager missions, which attempted to put in a rather, what we think, simple mathematical language, binary, notation like a computer uses information about life here on the earth in case some civilization at some far future time should pick up one of those Voyager satellites which has left the solar system. I think the probability of that is so close to zero it's not going to happen but they were thinking about it and others continue to think about it Andre that's a that's a very interesting serious question how do we try to communicate how do we try to communicate with other animals on this planet Lots of people work in that, and we have some success, but we've got a, a common evolution too. We're, um, have you ever tried to communicate with um, a spider? <laughs> That's very difficult, they're alien to us. You can talk to a dog, but try talking to a spider. Yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> uh, I now see a question kind of uh, related on this uh, astrobiology. Uh, uh, and also maybe related to our advances in uh, in uh, discoveries of uh, exoplanets. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, do you think that it's possible for life to evolve under much worse conditions than on the planet Earth? Uh, or it is that only uh, planets in a uh, uh, Goldilocks zone of their uh, parent star support life. Now, I would say that all astronomers thinking about this problem would let their thoughts extend to the possibility of life under very different conditions. We're starting by looking for life as we know it because it's something we understand, but we certainly don't rule out the possibility of finding life under different conditions or even life quite different from what we know. It's just, we, we don't know how to go about looking for that. You might've seen recently reported just last year, there were suggestions from chemical analysis of the upper atmosphere of Venus, that there might be a kind of life in the atmosphere of Venus. And I will talk about that in the next Astro Chat, which will be about Venus. Um, here in the solar system, one of the prime, two of the prime places to try to go looking for life are the little moons Europa, which orbit Jupiter, it's about the size of the Earth's moon, and Enceladus, which orbits Saturn, it's only about 500 kilometers in diameter. Both of them are covered in ice, but we can detect that they've got deep oceans under the ice. And many biologists, astrobiologists too, think it's possible that life first formed here on the Earth around hot ocean vents, so-called black smokers, deep in the ocean, four kilometers under the surface. 
And those conditions may exist on very alien um, worlds like Europa out orbiting Jupiter where we couldn't survive possibly at all, but other kinds of life, especially around hot water vents in an ocean might. Now, we're certainly letting our imaginations and our thoughts wander far afield of just a water planet with conditions like here on the Earth. Good question and very interesting to pursue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, uh, we, uh, we are ready uh, kind of uh, five minutes after our scheduled time. There are, of course, lots of questions. I really uh, thank uh, uh, people who uh, put them all and uh, uh, yeah, the time is unfortunate limit, so we cannot uh, answer all of them. But uh, let me ask uh, maybe a final question. Uh, then, uh, then you um, propose this topic. Uh, uh, in fact, almost the same time, quite recently, uh, uh, this flying saucers kind of uh, uh, reports appeared also in the news quite recently. Uh, uh, would you have some kind of explanation? What so special was in this? period of time? Why suddenly uh, this kind of extra news came kind of now? Or they come all the time and we just don't pay attention maybe? I, th I think they come all the time, Andre. I don't think oh. there's any coincidence. You need to go do your statistics. <laughs> <laughs> You're a physicist. Go, go look at the incidence of reports and see if there are more at the present time than at other times. <laughs> There could be. I mean, I could imagine there could be a time. That time just after World War II, the reports were very high, but people were very anxious. And there was less understanding of what was happening in the sky. And I think in times of tension and anxiety, you might get more reports. But I'm guessing um, that's somebody's master's thesis in sociology. Right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, it was uh, uh, very, very exciting and a uh, 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 chat about this hot topic. We uh, will look forward to, to uh, our next chat and uh, we hope uh, uh, those who came to this one will join us again in future. Uh, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Don. Uh, and see you all next time. I would also like to thank everybody and thank you all for your questions too. I really like the enthusiasm. That's great. Thanks very much.